first off, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining us tonight. I know it's six and, uh, you know, it's a nice Thursday evening. Uh, Mr. Low Ranger is joining us today from Cabo and he's been very gracious <laughs> to spend his time with us tonight. And uh, Mr. Cheadle is joining us from Pennsylvania, correct? That's or from Ohio today. Yeah. Ohio today. Go so back, today's, <laughs> tonight's presentation is uh, titled The Veteran's Shadow. We all cast a shadow. It's based off our, it's a culmination of all of our experiences and our journeys. But sometimes as uh, providers of healthcare, we focus a little bit too much on an individual shadow. So today we have Mr. Low Ranger and Mr. Cheadle to help provide some provide some feedback and to provide some clarity on the veteran shadow and how we can move past, you know, treating um, whether that's, you know, combat or PTSD and providing the patient that's sitting in front of us today. And maybe they just actually have leg pain today. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Cheadle and Mr. Low Ranger to introduce themselves. Uh, Mr. Cheadle. Awesome. Thanks, Hunter. And thank you team for, for having us. It's uh, truly an honor to be able to, to present and share our experiences. Uh, with the team today. So my name is Randy Cheadle. I was in the uh, Army for 28 and a half years. I'm currently retired. Uh, I was military police. I was a paratrooper, numerous deployments, uh, and and spent a lot of time in the military supervising uh, numerous soldiers. And, and obviously, when I was active duty, uh, I took part in the uh, active duty or military health care system. Um, I, I'm now in the VA system and, and we'll discuss a, a lot about that today. So look forward to being able to pass on uh, some of my, uh, my experiences. Uh, Chris. Yeah, hey, likewise. Uh, so I'm Chris Loringer. I'm uh, currently in the military, still serving. Uh, fun fact, uh, Hunter's dad used to be my commander when I was in Iraq in 2004. So even though I have 18 years, I originally came to the Army in 99, got out in 05 after three deployments. Uh, got to go back to California where I became a police officer and sheriff's deputy. Uh, unfortunately, I had to do the recession, lost my job, but decided to come back in the military uh, where I was able to have a chance to go to special forces. So from there, I did infantry uh, and then went through the special forces qualification course, which is really intense, uh, physically uh, demanding. Uh, I'll talk more about that later, but been in special forces now since 2009, 2022. So 13 years been doing that. So currently 41, I uh, just got back from Ranger school in January. So uh, age is just a number, but with all that, there comes a lot of wear and tear on your body. Um, so looking forward to describe some of my experiences uh, with everyone here today uh, to show that, you know, being the military and civilian, there's, there's two different, th uh, they're one and the same, but they're a little bit different. So having to deal with like the certain uh, issues that people in the mil military uh, deal with is, uh, unique, but still, still some of the same. So with that, appreciate it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm super excited. Congratulations, Chris, too. You know, so for those that, that are uh, attending in the audience, you know, to go to Ranger school at the age of 40, graduate at the age of 41 is, is re really unheard of, uh, in the military. You know, it's, uh, we get a lot of, uh, young enlistees that come in that, that want to do that high speed stuff and. And uh, I know it's really challenging, very physical and mentally demanding, you know, so congratulations, Chris. That's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that, Randy. All right, Hunter, if you're good, I'll go ahead and go through the agenda and, and uh, get us started here. All right, so uh, here's the here's the agenda. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the military. Uh, obviously, Chris and I, we have an Army background, but a lot of what we're going to talk about uh, relates to all branches of the military, uh, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, and, 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 you know, we're going to probably give you a lot of our experiences in, in the Army. We like to tell war, what we call war stories, so we'll pass some of those along and, and give you guys uh, kind of an upfront uh, visual, vi visualization of, of the, some things that we've been through. We're going to talk about some difficulties and challenges with the VA, some misconceptions with the VA, common injuries that are sustained uh, with military personnel, some misconceptions. We'll talk about the training and physical readiness of our military and, and how we how we train uh, our military and what's required uh, phys physically and mentally uh, from our military members, how to approach military and losses, and then also a little bit about uh, VA permanent and total disabilities and, and so forth. All right. Uh, so here's some common military misconceptions. You know, for those that uh, have never been around service members, I know when I joined the Army in 1989, um, 
I, I had never been around service members. I was the first uh, first person in my family to join the military. Um, and so the basically when I joined the army and I knew I was going to you know come face to face with a drill sergeant, uh, I, I'd watch stripes and other army shows, you know, full metal jacket, things like that. And so I kind of had that conception when I joined the army. And then when I got in the army, I realized that things were a whole lot, whole lot different. You know, so uh, what I did here was put uh, some of these misconceptions uh, out there so you guys can see them. You know, going in the military right out of high school means you'll not get a college education is, is one of those misconceptions. And I can tell you, I joined the military at the age of 18. Uh, spent tw I, My plan was to do five years in the Army, and then I was going to get out and be a state trooper in the state of Illinois. Uh, but after my first couple of years or first few years in the, in the Army, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I became a leader pretty quickly, and that was identified um, by my leadership. And 28 and a half years later, uh, I, I retired. Um, I have a master's degree in, in uh, criminal justice and homeland security. The, the United States Army paid for every bit of my education. Uh, the military is big about education. I spent a little time in corporate America because after I retired from the military, I, I served three and a half years as a uh, vice president of crisis management for PNC Bank. And my experiences in the military really set me up to to perform at a level that that was really high and the demands mentally and physically uh, were still there even after I got out of the military, you know, so once I started working with PNC. I was still working, you know, 18 hours a day, responding to events uh, in the middle of the night. And as as y'all well know, you know, you must remain physically fit, you know, to to keep your mental status up, you know, to stay mentally fit. Uh, so that was that was a challenge. Um, some of the the other misconceptions. I, I tell people this story all the time that I, I went to a bank one time and and they found out that I was in the military and the first question out of the teller's mouth was, "Do you have PTSD?" Well, no, I don't have PTSD, but it's probably not something you should ask every military member. And and there's misconceptions out there about about PTSD uh, in general and and how service members um, react with PTSD because you, as you all well know, uh, there's different levels. And uh, but the bottom line is that that's a, a misconception that a lot of military members or all military members have PTSD. Um, all service members are resilient. That that's another misconception out there. That okay, if you if you served in the military, uh, then when when you get out, then then you're going to you know say what's on your mind. You're going to be competent, confident, and, and you're going to be resilient and be able to handle anything that's that's thrown your way. Um, but but military members have cha challenges as well uh, in, in a lot of cases dealing with things you know emotionally. Um, there's a lot of separation in the military. Service members are separated from their families a lot. They're separated from their loved ones. And um, so that, that's another um, misconception. And then last but not least, the last bullet I want to talk about before we hand it over to Chris and get some of, you know, some of the things that he's experienced with some of the, the soldiers he's dealt with is that you shouldn't talk to service members about their deployments. Um, <laughs> And about some of their experiences, because I can tell you, me, me personally, I love talking about my time in the military. I love talking about my experiences. Um, like Chris uh, Hunter's dad was also my my uh, squad leader in Germany, uh, and we we've been on the phone. We can sit on the phone for hours and, and and just talk about our experiences and how we grew through those experiences. And but I pass that along also with with uh, those that I continue to serve with. So I, I'm now a substitute teacher and, and I mentor. Uh, kids K through 12, um, and and they they like to hear about my time in the military as well, you know. And I try to pa pass on, you know, some of my experiences. Now, granted, I've seen some things that that <laughs> I would not share with them, you know, at different grades and different levels. But for the most part, you know, it, it's good for me to to tell them that hey, the military it was a great place to start, as they used to say, um, and and it it turned me into a man. It, it made me made me who I am in, in my senior years and, and it turned me into a, a great leader and I'm very thankful for my time in the military. Um, so Chris, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, you know, maybe to expand a little bit as well. <laughs> yeah, Randy, that's, that's very well said. You know, I, I think I cannot agree with more of everything you said, especially uh, uh, joining uh, young on, you're able to be thrown a lot of experiences that a normal person typically does not do, get to experience. I mean, at 18 years old, I had a gun and I was able to deploy overseas and represent my country. It's not something you're, typical 18 year old can do. So you're throwing a lot of situations, especially those that are, that are younger. So on my third deployment, I was 20 years old, getting blown up by IEDs with people that wanted to kill me. So as a younger person trying to understand 
of what was going on. It's kind of hard because you're a lot younger and your brain and your, your ability to comprehend what's going on hadn't really, fo hadn't really fully formed yet. And so I got out at 23, 24 years old and was out of the army for four and a half years. And during that time, I probably had time to like comprehend and kind of process uh, what I had experienced. And uh, luckily I was able to come back in the army. I was 20, 28 years old. And luckily I was able to experience a lot of that same stuff again, but I was older and I was able to understand a lot of the stuff that was going on. I've been on a total of nine deployments since, uh, since I came back in. So being that I'm older now, I understand this a lot differently now than when I did when I was younger. So looking at some of these bolts here, like you should not talk to your service members about their deployments. Uh, all service members are resilient. I think you get, everyone's different. And from my experience, because I still stay in contact with all those that I deployed with when I was younger, and I see those that got out of the army when they're younger, those experiences affect them differently than those that got to stay in and experience the same stuff at an older age, if that makes sense. Um, so they have different problems the way that they deal with it, whereas it is, it's, it's different to me, if that makes sense. Um, but I will say, I think every, some military members, they deal with PTSD a little bit. Uh, some are able to uh, handle it better than others. And I have a lot of friends that, you know, rightfully so have been some, in some bad situations that, uh, they, they still deal with it in their own way. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the military, they commit suicide. They have alcohol and substance abuse problems. Uh, team star, my team, he, uh, he actually gets phone calls all the time because he volunteers as like a crisis response people where people uh, have issues and they need to talk to someone. So it, military members are not immune and people on the civilian side are, are not immune. Doesn't matter how old you are and what your experiences are, everyone deals with things differently. And it's about getting people to open up and feel comfortable uh, uh, and, and talk to that. Because unfortunately, a lot of people just hold it in, bottle in. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not easy. Yeah, those are all great points. And uh, also all military members, uh, just because you're in the military doesn't mean that you've deployed, that you've been overseas or that you fought in combat. You know, there, there are some of us like like Chris and I and the units that we served in, they, they did serve, serve in combat, you know, and um, like Chris, I have numerous deployments and I, and I found myself in a rut where I just happened to go from unit to unit to unit that happened to be on the deployment schedule that was going into places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Cuba, Desert Storm, and, and so forth, you know, so, but then again, you might have another uh, soldier that's been in just as long as, as Chris and I that have never served overseas, you know, or maybe they were stationed overseas, but they never served in a combat deployment, you know, and, but, but having said that also, just because they haven't been to a combat deployment doesn't mean they still don't suffer from PTSD or the same type, uh, same kinds of injuries and, and so forth that those that do, do deploy. Okay, um, moving on to the next slide. Um, I'll talk a little bit here about some VA misconceptions and I'll talk a little bit about the VA and then uh, Chris will talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the military healthcare system and what's available to active duty soldiers. But uh, some of the misconceptions are that the VA doesn't care about timely service to service members. I know uh, a lot of you might have heard or, or might have heard over time, you know, things on the news about the VA and, and how it takes forever uh, for VA for um, service members or retirees or veterans to get into the system and, and, and see a service provider that's really dependent on the VA location. Um, it, it's not the same across the board and it's not systemic across the board, you know, and um, in some of these slides up or I think in the one of the next upcoming slides, there's a link that you guys can see some of the uh, IG actually it's at the bottom of, of, of uh, this side slide uh, uh, some the IG's report on uh, the VA and some of the misconceptions with the VA. Another one is that the VA will only see service members for issues that are service connected. Uh, I, I believe that when I, when I got out of the army and the, the army has what they call soldier for life transition assistance program. So when every soldier transitions out of the military, <clears throat> excuse me, they have to go through this program. They have to fill out a resume. They have to prove that they have, you know, are interviewing for jobs and are going to be just as successful outside of the military. And I thought that uh, when I went through the process of, of submitting my list of injuries and, and getting my physical and seeing doctors, that when I retired from the military, I would only be able to go to the VA to be seen for those injuries. However, 
if you're rated at a certain level or above, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on the location, um, they will see you for, for anything, you know, and, and I don't mind sharing, for example, you know, I'm 100% disabled and those that are 100% disabled can be seen uh, at any location. Excuse me, give us one second. So I can be seen for at any location for, <clears throat> excuse me, any injury. Um, Chris, you want to want to take it? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give you a little break. So I, I will say that uh, as a caveat, I, I, I never used the VA. Uh, I got out in 2005 and I thought, you know, me, I was going to become a police officer that if I went to the VA and shown <laughs> that, that I had some sort of disability or I, I was seeing the VA for any of my issues, like I, my hearing, I lost a lot of hearing when I was in Iraq. I wore no earplugs, uh, was in a lot of firefights. My hearing's shot. I have tonight. It's really bad. Uh, I had neck issues. Uh, I had some injuries from some jumps we had. And so I thought, and I had a little bit of PTSD at that time because uh, I was in some bad stuff in, in Fallujah that I've had a couple episodes. I won't say episodes. I just had some flashbacks. I haven't had any issues since then, but at that time I was still young. I was like, well, I should probably go to the VA and try to get some disability. To me, I thought if I got disability, it would disqualify me from a lot of jobs. So I never reached out for help. I never got any percentage of disability because I, I thought it was going to impact my ability to become a police officer. Hindsight now, that was not the case. Uh, I should have gone and at least got some uh, disability and some help. But at the time, I was a police officer. I had really good health insurance. I, did, I didn't see that as a, uh, a resource to myself. Looking back at it now, I'm at 18 years of service. The potential for me to get out in three years uh, and retire. Uh, you can bet that I'm going to go see the VA and there's resources out there uh, for me to help with my medical claim. So I'm right now I'm uh, <laughs> I'm going through pain management. I got neck issues from a free fall accident when my parachute didn't open up. I had a uh, 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 my neck is messed up from that accident. My tinnitus has gotten worse. Uh, my back is messed up. I have a myriad of health problems that right now I'm creating a, a medical record of. So when I do get out, the VA will be able to see that not only have I had these injuries, but I'm doing things to uh, to better my condition as opposed to, oh, I'm, oh I have these uh, issues. I'm not going to do anything until I get out. They want to see that you've been doing a uh, doing certain procedures or going to see help to get better. And that's from my experiences from seeing people get out and use the VA is that trying to fix it now rather than later will help you out long term. So I yeah. want to touch on a little bit of a point, Mr. Cheadle and, and uh, Mr. Uh, Low Ranger. Um, when a lot of the times the students think of the VA, we think of injury sustained in combat. But from what I'm hearing, it can be an injury sustained in training. So I want to, you know, from my understanding of, you know, training, I've seen you guys do ruck marches. I've seen some guys bleed through their boots. So. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of important to kind of emphasize that no, it's not just uh, you know losing your hearing in combat, but it's also losing your hearing when you're you know at the range and you know you're you're trained to be a soldier. Yeah, Hunter, I think the biggest thing is that we work. Uh, it's not nine to five. We work uh, twenty four seven, and it could be in the worst environmental conditions. It could be in the best environmental conditions, but you're going to be. Anywhere at any time, and you could be in training in the heat and humidity of North Carolina, or you'd be training in the, the cold of like Alaska in the winter time. Like I was in ranger school in the, in, in the, in the winter months and my feet right now, I still don't have feeling in them because. For 1 of our training exercises we spent 5 days out in the field, uh, it rained the entire time and it was just below freezing. And so I, I couldn't change my socks. My feet were frozen and I'm still suffering from essentially frost nip and I'm it's slowly getting feeling back, but just one example of, of training where I'm still having issues with my, just my feet. <laughs> yeah, I was doing a lot of foot marches right before I retired and you know, I was climbing some mountains and, and same thing here, you know, ended up going through physical therapy right before retirement. And, you know, so the VA, you know, that continues on outside of the military, you know, wasn't combat was not combat related, but the VA is now assisting me and get me, you know, rehabilitated through, you know, that injury. Yeah. I got a rhabdo rhabdomyolysis in the qualification course in this uh one it was summertime, June in North Carolina. It was called Small Unit Tactics, Think Ranger School, but for special forces. It was just six o'clock in the morning, hundred percent humidity, hundred something degrees out. 
And we spent three hours. We had to do a layout. And they're like, hey, six pairs of socks. And you had five seconds to do it. And then we get smoked. We had to run like 50 meters back. And we're like just rolling around. Uh, long story short, 15 of us went down as heat injuries. I ended up seeing the medic like, hey, something's not right. I know my body. And I ended up getting three IVs, went to the hospital. They're like, yeah, you have rhabdomyolysis. <laughs> and that stays with me for the rest of my life. And so I have to be cognizant of like, hey, if my body feels a certain way now, it's I have to uh, recognize that or it can get worse. Yeah. The last, the last two on here, the VA does not have specialized services or, or treatment. The VA has a wide variety of, of special services. Uh, and when I first signed up for the VA, um, they said, hey, if you want acupuncture, you, you, you want to go see a chiropractor, phys obviously physical therapy, anything like that. They have a wide range of specialized services and that they'll do referrals for as well. So you don't have to stay within the, the VA system. And last but not least, uh, I was an engine service, so I'm not eligible for VA healthcare. I think we kind of discussed that a little bit is, you, you know, it, it, from the time you join the military to the time that you retire, uh, you're eligible for VA benefits uh, whenever you leave the military. All right, um, moving on here to the next slide, the VA challenges. I'm sorry, yeah, this is where the, the office of the, the IG report, um, the, the office of the VA or the OI, uh, OIG is to serve veterans and their families and caregivers, you know, so uh, they go in from time to time uh, through all VA facilities. Uh, they conduct inspections to make sure that uh, military members are receiving um, class A, you know, healthcare, um, and you know, as you as you see here, you know, the the challenges that that came out of the last OIG report was healthcare services benefits for veterans, stewardship of taxpayers' dollars, information systems, and innovation and leadership and governance. You know, so you know, as technology improves, uh, as as an example, uh, in being able to take care of of military members, you know, and, and COVID hit, and a lot of people are doing tele. To, you know, tele appointments and things like that. Um, the VA has to be able to maintain contact with its uh, with its veterans and continue to provide that health care. So I provided a link here for with the full OIG report. Uh, but each of these different areas uh, are items that they found needed improvement within the VA system, or that there were some challenges uh, in these different areas. And I can tell you, for healthcare services. I, I, when I retired out of the military, I originally signed up for healthcare services in Pennsylvania when I was working at PNC at the headquarters in Pittsburgh. Uh, and the VA system there was fabulous. You know, you know, I could same day appointments. I could be seen at any time. Uh, but then when I moved to Ohio, after I resigned from PNC to, to teach, uh, I now you know, am, am, am being seen by the Cleveland and Northeast Ohio VA. And you can see a, a tremendous difference. You know, not they're I won't say they're bad or that they're horrible, but but they're not as good as the services that I was receiving in Pennsylvania. Um, there's now I haven't said that too. I, a lot of my stuff gets referred out, so I end up going to different locations for services. So overall, it's overall it's pretty good, but uh, it is different. I, I'll put it to you that way. Then in Pennsylvania, where it was one stop shop. So, Chris, anything to to add to to this one? No, you're the uh, you're the expert when it comes to this. Uh, I'm sure when I get out in three to nine years, I'll I'll have a lot more understanding of uh, of uh, of these these uh, services right here. And I th also think for healthcare professionals, for when things do get do get referred out, that it's fair to ask military members, you know, okay, what kind of service do you, is the VA providing you, right? Because every healthcare care system is different. Every hospital is different. You know, every doctor is different. So. Uh, it, it's important to for military members, I think, um, for them to be asked, hey, what is the VA doing for you? Or, or is there their limitations to what the VA can do um, so that service members receive top of the line health care? Um, Hunter, do you have any questions or, or anything on that uh, particular topic? Nope, I think we're I think we're ready for the next slide. Okay. All right, so physical training requirements, you know, um, I went ahead and pulled this up. There's an army regulation. It's, uh, it can be found online. I dropped the link here at the bottom of this slide that covers, okay, what do military, well, this is particularly for army. What do, you, what do soldiers have to do to remain physically fit? But at, at the same time, as soldiers are, are working so hard to remain physically fit, they sustain injuries um, while they're conducting physical training. So the objective of Army Physical Readiness Training is to enhance combat readiness and leadership effectiveness by 
developing and sustaining a high level of physical readiness and soldiers as measured by the seven criteria listed on this slide, you know, so strength and endurance and mobility and body composition, all that matters. You know, I was having a conversation with somebody today, you know, so when you're in the military, you, you have to be a, you know, you your, your body fat composition and it's changed over time, but there are standards as prescribed by an army regulation so that you look good in uniform, that you present a good military appearance. So if you're somebody that just likes to, you know, work out your biceps or your triceps, you know, and you're in the gym and you're pumping iron every day, but you can't run 30 feet down the road because your cardiovascular system isn't, isn't up to par, then, then the military will judge you uh, accordingly and soldiers can get separated for not meeting, you know, your physical readiness standards or your body, uh, your body composition. Uh, not to mention your, your physical health, right? Obviously, we want soldiers to be healthy uh, while they're in the military. Um, you know, the, the warrior ethos mission first, never accept defeat, you know, should, you know, be driven in, in all soldiers. And some soldiers are just so competitive. Uh, I'll put Christian in that category um, where you work so hard and, and you try so hard to, to beat the in enemy that you end up getting injured uh, during training. Uh, the self-discipline, competitive spirit, the will to win and, and unit cohesion uh, is, is driven into every soldier every day. So, Three to five times a day, soldiers are getting up at uh, you know four or five uh, o'clock in the morning, and they're doing physical training. For those that uh, have shift schedules, when they get off shift, they're they're doing physical training and they're getting tested on it regularly. Um, and Chris, I'll have you talk a little bit on this one because I know this is right up your alley. <laughs> I'll pass it over to you a little bit. Yeah. So so this right here is the baseline. This is what basically every soldier has to have to graduate from basic training is having. The ability to you see it right here bullets 1 through 7 have all that stuff and the special forces community or, or SAS special operations forces because that entails like civil affairs psyops and special forces. We have our own uh, set of requirements as well on top of that and it, don't think of it as just physical fitness. It's it's mental toughness because. You know, your, your mind can make you do a lot more than what your, your body can do when you've reached your max and doing things. Like we have, like when I went to selection, we had 420 people. And at the end of it, we graduated like 140. And that's just selection. And then there's a two year pipeline you still have to go through. So there, there's a lot of, I guess the core of this is when you look at the, the military and civilian side, is that uh, in the military, I'm at, I'm 41 years old, still on a special forces team, and I still have to remain physically and mentally tough to conduct our missions where there's not a lot of support. Like I'm, I we had a ruck up a mountain. I'm carrying a 90 pound rucksack up on a mountain and survive up there for four to five days, and then ruck back down. Uh, and that requires a lot of mental and physical uh, uh, toughness to do that. A lot of the people in the regular military don't have to do that, so there's a little bit of difference there. But when you look at the military to civilian side. A lot of civilian don't have to have these physical requirements to maintain their ability to to work a nine to five job. Like my wife, she's a massage therapist. She, regardless of how physically in shape she is, I mean, she still has to you know massage people's backs and stuff. But she doesn't have this requirement to maintain her job. Like those in the military, we have to re maintain physical, we have to be in shape, or we're going to get kicked out of the army. And so um, there's a requirement and a mental. Uh, uh, need to maintain the lifestyle and a lot of people don't and they get out of shape they get unhealthy and then because of that when people are not in shape that creates other effects where they start getting hurt uh, and they need to start seeing medical treatment because they're not able to maintain their, their uh, physical toughness yeah and i'll tell uh, you so here, real quick i got a message uh saying that the screen is white can you just move your mouse around to, uh, to see um, is anybody else having any screen issues? It looks good on my end, guys. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Sorry for the interruption, Mr. Cheadle. Uh, please, please continue. <laughs> no, no worries. And I'll say that in the, in the, the military is getting better about this. Well, I know the army is getting better at this, uh, but to Chris's point, um, you know, when I when I, I told you I was working at, at PNC, you know, I was still you know working out and remain physically fit and and running and, and stuff like that. And in, in the army, you don't you don't get a bad day, you know, in, in some cases or in many cases. You're you're required to get up and you're required to go to formation and you're required to do physical fitness. Um, and if 
if if there's a leader out there that isn't um, you know trained or or you know in, involved in the physical fitness, they can you know a lot of the injuries in the military are overuse injuries, right? So if you have a soldier that's over, overweight, the answer isn't hey let's run them another ten miles, you know because then then you'll you'll end up injuring the soldier. And we're we're gonna talk a little bit about that and some of the injuries that soldiers um, receive in the military. But you know, no, all great points, Chris. Okay, um, talk, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the deployments and, and Chris and I both have, have deployed, you know, got numerous deployments under our, our belts. Um, and like I said, I, I just happened to end up in, in uh, I won't say a rut, but <laughs> in, in a phase where I ended up going on a lot of overseas deployments and, and a lot of combat deployments. But to give you an idea of what these deployments are like, um, the locations for the United States Army are really fr uh, fr to and from all locations around the globe. You know, it doesn't matter where it's at, you know, to include the Baltics, uh, Alaska, the Middle East, and, and so forth. So all around the globe, we've got U.S. forces uh, stationed. The, the durations of these deployments are really de de dependent on the orders and the organization that you're in. Now, I put on here 30 days, 90 days, and one year, but... Uh, these de these deployments could be really any number in length, uh, and many cases, like in, in my case, you know, I, I could do a year deployment, come back for six months, and then be out the door for another year deployment. You know, so um, it, during my time in the military, I think I had nine nine plus or ten ten deployments. You know, and and you know, five or six combat tours. So, but not every soldier goes through that. Now, obviously, Chris, you'll be in special operations <laughs> forces. He <laughs> he definitely goes out the door more than, than most. Um, yeah, I've been deployed every year since 2013. There's every year I've been gone <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. And so, like I said, they're, they're rotational. So it takes a toll on the family. It takes a toll on your body and so forth. The living conditions of these deployments, uh, once again, are all over the globe. So you could be either in the middle of the desert or in some cases, some of these deployments, you could be in a, in a hotel. You know, so, so um, just because somebody says they've deployed doesn't necessarily mean they've been in the austere condition, but it also doesn't mean they've been in the best conditions. I think it's important for everybody to real, realize that if you're doing a questionnaire or you're talking to a patient or a veteran is kind of, it's important to get an understanding of where they've been and what they've done and the toll that it's taken on their body. You know, Chris had alluded earlier about the, the weather conditions and environments, anything from freezing cold to extreme heat you know, and soldiers and leaders are trained to deal with these conditions, you know, how to how to try to stay warm during freezing conditions. But some sometimes the challenges are just so severe that that, you know, the and the risk level is so high that we have to endure those conditions to accomplish the mission. Uh, same thing with extreme heat and, and uh, you know, heat stroke and, you know, heat stress and and, and everything that soldiers are, are, are a lot of soldiers, you know, receive the, or I should pretty much all soldiers receive you know, the medical training they need to respond to these things, but the conditions can be so austere that uh, the mission has to accomplish and, and the military will accept that risk. Um, the, I'll hit this last one, Chris, and then if you want to talk about any of these, we'll, we'll definitely dive into those, you know, mental resiliency and family separations and relationships. Uh, those can be really strong. I can tell you the, the, the deployments I've been on and the supervisory role that I've had, you know, just there's a saying in the army that that your team leader, or your sergeant, or the person your supervisor is your chaplain. They're your parent. They're your brother. They're your sister. You know, they they play every role and wear all these different hats because uh, it's one team, one fight. And there's a lot of time spent away from home, so you share you share those uh, those challenges with with each other. And it, and it can be difficult at time for some to maintain mental resiliency uh, and physical resiliency. So, Chris, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, I think the one thing that the mental resiliency, family separations, relationships, I think the one thing that if I could boil deployments down is that you're able to ex be in a situation that the only people you think understand what you're going through are those that went through that experience that with you. So, like, I have people that I probably haven't seen in 15, 16 years where we were deployed together. And when I see them, it's just like we had that shared hardship and that shared experience where it, I felt like I hadn't seen them in like a day. And it, we were able to re reconnect with all those shared hardship, hardships together. And when I got out, that's one of the things I missed. Um, I missed that. But going back to the deployment side, you could be in a location where it's a small camp. Everywhere you go, you have to wear body armor. You're in a tent with no air conditioner and you're sharing it with like 20 dudes. Uh, 
to a nice uh, base that's well stocked and you have like a Starbucks and you have a, a PX where you can buy whatever you want. You have Wi-Fi, you have electricity and like going from a very austere camp where <laughs> the threat of being overrun and being attacked is real. And then flying to some place where everyone's clean, they have showers, <laughs> they have water, they, they have a, a big chow hall. It's, it's kind of frustrating <laughs> to say the least, but I've got to experience the full spectrum of it. So I can't complain. But I will say having that as an experience and having an appreciation for what people go through when they deploy is a, it, it's a thing. No, great point, Chris. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, you know, th there's a lot of soldiers out there when, when seeing a provider, you know, they might not outwardly say it, but inside, you know, they're thinking, well, you just don't understand, or you wouldn't understand what I've been through. So as a provider, it's important to say, hey, help help me understand a little bit about what you've been through, where you've been, you know, so that because that way the, the service member can be best best treated. Yeah, quick vignette, real quick. Uh, when I went through the qualification course, uh, uh, the special forces groups wanted to have their, their uh, surgeons, uh, battalion surgeons, uh, understand what we went through. So they actually sent their surgeons who were lieutenant colonels and colonels, and they're like 50 plus years old through our qualification course. So they get a, They were able to get an understanding of the physical and mental and all the hardships that went through. So they actually earned a special forces tab and then they, be, but then they went straight back to becoming a battalion surgeon. And that made, that was a huge benefit to our, uh, to our formation having providers that could actually understand what we went through and provide the right kind of treatments to what uh, uh, what, what we were going through. So I, I'll hand it back. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so I want to show you here some of the common injuries um, that uh, military members sustain. You know, musculoskeletal injuries caused by acute incidents as well as chronic repeated stresses to the body have uh, been described as the single biggest health problem of the U.S. military. Almost 50% of military experience one or more injury each year. They result in over 2 million medical encounters uh, annually across military services. They require 90 to 120 more days of restricted work or lost duty. So in the military, if a soldier get in the army, if a soldier gets injured, um, they get what's called a profile or restricted duty. And and um, for so many days, then then they have to take it easy, right? Or not overuse, you know, those those you know body parts that are that are injured. And as you can see, the next next line, most are overuse strains, sprains, and stress fac fractures, most to lower extremities, ankle, foot, knees, and lower legs. Um, you know, I, I know I jumped out of airplanes for a few years, you know, in, in North Carolina, and, and you know, at, at the age of 21 or 22, you know, you, you don't feel those things, but you get to the age of 52 now, you know, I, I can feel the, the constant pounding uh, of those jumps on my knees and ankles and, and so forth. More than half of these injuries are, are exercise or sports related. When I joined the military, I was as competitive as they can. I was very active in sports and a lot of our soldiers were active in sports and that excitement and talking with recruiters and wanting to be the best that they can be is, is why they joined the military. And, well, that doesn't stop when they join the military. So they still like to play basketball and football and baseball. And, and stay physically fit and have fun. And, and there's a lot of injuries sustained there as well. And then back and shoulder injuries are also common, more often associated with lifting and carrying activities. You know, so I told you I jumped out of airplanes and I've done a lot of foot marches. So uh, carrying a lot of things on my back, did mountain mountain climbing to get some to some austere uh, locations. And in some cases it was just me on my off time wanting to stay physically fit, you know, and and overusing, you know, you know, my back or my hips or my knees and and so forth. So um, there's one to show you the these numbers so you get an idea of the number of injuries. You know, so two million medical encounters annually is is huge in my book. You know, that number sticks out to me. So Chris, uh, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, I just, uh, I guess, yeah, I went through ranger school at 40 years old, uh, finished almost 41 years old. I started, uh, I was weighing about 210, 215 pounds. Uh, by the time I finished, I was 175 pounds. So you're, uh, long days, you don't sleep, probably about 45 minutes of sleep a day. You can go on YouTube and Google ranger school, U.S. Army ranger school, probably do a lot better than I could ever explain. But it's intense. Uh, you're, like I said, about 10, 15,000 calories you're burning a day, and you're only eating twice a day, once at 5 30 in the morning, and then again, not till like almost midnight. So you're not really eating, and you're taking a lot of toll in your body. You're wearing heavy rucksacks, going up mountains, going through swamps, and just in austere terrain. 
and every step is an adventure because you're carrying a lot of weight. You have a lot of stuff going on, and especially in a leadership school, you're also making sure your guy to your left is doing what they're supposed to. But just doing that every day, even training up for that, and guys doing physical fitness just to maintain, uh, takes a long toll on your body. And, and as I've hit 18 years in, uh, it, it starts to wear on you. And like I said, lately I've been going through pain management, trying to fix some of the issues with my knees, my feet, my neck. Uh, it, it does take a toll on you, and that stress can have a, a literal impact on uh, how you on on, uh, on your day to day uh, life. So, I'm sure after doing 26, 28 years, you know, <laughs> you felt a little bit of it. And uh, at 41, I still feel like I'm I'm in my 20s, but I'm definitely feeling it now, especially in in, in my line of work. But I have to hide it. <laughs> I can't be the guy where all oh, my back hurts. Hey, we got a mission. We got to go out. I, I just I can't. So I. A lot of uh, what guys do is they push through it when they shouldn't. And I've seen guys do that, and that's how they get injured. And now that I'm older now, uh, I'm starting to push pause. Like, hey, I, I need to get this taken care of. So I'm actually seeing medical providers working on my neck. Like, I need to get some R&R. So I'm in Cabo, Mexico, hanging out on the beach in the pool, trying to relax. Because a lot of people, they don't they don't relax and, and try to uh, take, take some rest, um, as opposed to going 100 mile an hour 24-7. So... A little bit of my experience, um, trying to trying to live by that now a little bit. So, Chris, all I gotta say about that, Chris. If it makes you feel better, I put the pounds on that you took off. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, that's a, it's important with veterans and, and our older veterans as well. You know, we we like to think we can still do what we were doing when we were eighteen and twenty. You know, so when talking with our providers too, you know, I've been told time or two, dial it, dial it back, right? You, you're not the, the same age you were. Um, Okay, so some more some more of the common injuries, you know, overuse strains, hearing loss and tinnitus is very common in the military. Uh, Chris just alluded to that. There's some changes, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, coming soon uh, with the VA as it relates to uh, tinnitus and um, and how they're going to be treating for it. Loss of limbs, yeah, I can tell you the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan really took a toll on our on our military as it related to to loss of limbs and dealing with uh, IEDs and, and explosive devices. Head injuries and tra traumatic brain injuries were also very common. Um, you know, you know, since 9-11 and the, and the wars we fought since 9-11, uh, PTSD and other mental disorders such as anxiety and, and insomnia, uh, sleep apnea. Uh, limited range of motion, especially in the ankles and knees. Uh, and I also posted an article here for Medline Plus as it relates to to veterans and, and a lot of the common injuries sustained within the military. So in your free time, please feel free uh, to check that out. And then last but not least, uh, I, you know, I, what I wanted to do is, you know, there's my information, here's Chris's information, but at the very top, there's the Ohio Veteran Service Organization POC. So Every county and in in particularly in the state of Ohio and, and a lot of the other states, to be honest with you, across the United States are required to have veteran service organizations. Right? So um, this link here will show you the, the VSO uh, in the county that you, you you're, that you're practicing in. If you ever have any questions as it relates to veterans and veterans care, these are the subject matter experts when in dealing with the VA. If they don't know the answer, they can get you in contact with the, the right person that can. So. Um, if you, you know, we, we obviously encourage you to reach out to those, but if you can't, you know, you can contact me anytime and, and, uh, I'll offer up Chris out there. <laughs> he's yeah, he's my not, email. <laughs> not overseas cause he's active duty, but, uh, you know, I'm semi-retired, so I'll do the be very best that I can, but that link should be very helpful for the, the group on this call. So Chris, anything to add to that? No, I mean, I, I, I appreciate sharing this conversation with you. Uh, I'm still busy, but I'm never too busy to answer an email, especially Hunter. Like I said, you know, I, I served under his dad 15, 17, 2004. Uh, and so trying to maintain contact, I think has been really awesome. And it's been awesome seeing your growth and your progression. So uh, I wish nothing but the best for you and everyone else here. Um, if you ever have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out at uh, any time. Yeah. All right, Hunter, over to you, over to you my friend. All right, so now we get to go into the fun part of the webinar. This is the conversation section where I get to grill you guys on some questions that I started developing and hopefully we get some chats or some questions into the chat. So, um, Chris, I know you're a dad. I know you have 2 sons. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about family separation. Um, you know, we, we've kind of learned that you can be away from your family for 30, 
90 to, to a year. What is that stress on you when you're overseas? <laughs> oh, I think uh, my wife, we're, we've been together for 14 years. Uh, we, we met when I was in California and I was, uh, I was in law enforcement. Uh, but I think she initially didn't know what uh, she was getting, getting herself into. Uh, it, it's been hard. Uh, both of my sons were born while I was gone. Uh, my first son was born. I was in Fort Benning, Georgia, going through infantry school. And then uh, second son uh, was I was luckily I was able to be there just just in time. Uh, so I got lucky. Uh, but having young kids going through not only just the qualification course, but being the army, but constantly being deployed. Uh, I've been even like I've been deployed every year since 2013. But when I'm back home, I'm either gone away in training. Uh, I'm busy uh, as the assistant detachment commander. I'm constantly even if I'm home. I'm still taking care of stuff sometimes till nine, 10 o'clock at night. And my phone's constantly like my phone has been ringing off the hook since I've been doing this, trying to take care of stuff. So being able to focus on, on my kids has, has been hard, uh, trying to find that work life balance. Now that I'm getting a little bit older and, and but still having to maintain the same tempo, uh, I try to prioritize time with the family. Like I'm in Cabo with the family right now. Like this is important. I told my command, I'm going to go take leave. We've been playing this. I'm going to spend some time with the family because as soon as I get back, I'm going to training for the next three weeks and I'm going to be gone. Like I'll be uh, at a location for three weeks and I'll just be gone. So luckily COVID uh, was tough because my wife works. Um, so that, that has been tough. I'm not going to lie. We're uh, a lot of guys go through divorce and we've had that conversation and it's been hard. Uh, but we're able to make it work uh, and there's compromises that go on, on both ends. Um, it just, it's finding the right woman that that's hard and <laughs> bless my wife. <laughs> she puts up with a lot. Um, so some other questions that I had, um, how important is socks? <laughs> It's the number one thing you need. So <laughs> I, can, I can give you some uh, some brands, but uh, Smart Wool and Darn Tough are by far the best things uh, to have. My wife is mad because I, I have so many socks and shoes. <laughs> she 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 hates it. But majority of my time is on my feet. You got to take care of your feet. Mm -hmm. Thanks, <laughs> so I've always had this question. I know you guys uh, were, were in Iraq. Um, and I've seen the gear that you guys wear. How do you deal with the heat? I imagine it ha you have to be just on fire underneath all that gear. How do you how do you yeah. mentally you know just separate? <laughs> it, it, it's hard. It's it's having having to tune away. So like I said, I had rhabdo, uh, and so I'm more susceptible to heat injuries. So for me, uh, on the back of my kit, you have to have your back flare with all your stuff on there. But I maintain a spot for a Camelback. Uh, a lot of guys don't have it, but I know that if I'm not drinking water. Uh, I can, I'm more susceptible to that heat injury and that makes, takes me away from my performance on doing the mission. So it's, <laughs> it, trust me, I know it's hot, <laughs> but always having a water source next to me has been, uh, it's like my little, my, my blanket. I need, I need that. Hunter, I'll tell you, there were three things that got me through 28 and a half years in, in the army and, and all that physical readiness and the deployments. And that's always tried to stay physically fit, always tried to remain flexible. Right. And always stay hydrated. Right. And, you know, and as long as I was doing those things, I, you know, I don't, I don't drink personally myself currently um, and really never, never had. And, and in the military, you know, as long as I was staying hydrated, you know, to help prevent heat cramps and, you know, any, any type of heat casualties, I always did. I, I probably stretched and remained flexible more than the average soldier. Um, and, and that always kept me, you know, to, to where my muscles weren't, aching and bones weren't a popping and creaking, you know, and then remained physically fit. You know, those three things then helped me in those austere environments. My last duty assignment was Fort Irwin, uh, California, the National Training Center. It was 117 degrees the day I left there. I was out in the middle of the desert, you know, and and like I said, those three things as a so and unfortunately not every soldier does that, right? You know, and but uh that those were the three things that got me through 28 years of those austere conditions, wearing all that equipment and being in uh, all those different weather environments. Yeah, I mean, one thing I've seen since I got out is I, I've, I have buddies that have gotten out. And one thing I've seen throughout my many years is when people get out, they lose that focus. They lose that drive and that requirement to stay in shape. And so there's a lot of people that the only reason why they worked, did PT in the morning is because they had to. 
when they got out, there was nothing forced them to do that. So what I've seen is a lot of people gain a lot of weight. They start getting medical issues. And because they lost that sense of focus, that drive, because they didn't work out, there was repercussions. They don't have that. So I've seen a lot of people out of shape with this, a myriad of uh, uh, health issues and it, it, it's unhealthy. And, and I've seen that time and time again when people get out and they start having all these health issues. Um, but I will say to your point, Randy, is like people that remain physically in shape and have some sort of focus or drive. For like me, when I got out of the army, I did triathlons and that was my focus to keep me going. Like now I, I do ultra marathons, so I have to maintain a healthy lifestyle and continue being in shape. And I'm 41 years old, still in the army, and I have to be in shape. So I'm not the last guy. I may not be the first guy, but I'm not the last guy when we're doing uh, team PT. That's awesome. So the one thing that I really wanted to kind of touch upon, and I think we kind of touched upon it when we were talking about the physical requirements of being in the army, but I kind of call this the hidden curriculum of basics training, which is, I think, uh, Chris touched upon, which is the psychological factor of training. You know, um, I'm not very familiar with it, but from what, from, a from a outside perspective, I know you guys will go out into the field. And do field training, and then you'll have an opposing field training, you know, wake you up at like five in the morning, three in the morning. <laughs> so I wanted you guys to kind of touch upon the psychological aspect of training that you guys have to go through, the mental endurance, not only with the physical endurance that you have to meet, but the psychological things that the army puts you through. Also touch upon, you know, I know you guys had to get CS gas at one point. <laughs> Go, go ahead, Chris, you go first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have a lot of uh, examples. Uh, I'll pick this one. So small unit tactics, uh, special forces qualification course. It's November. I want you to picture that you haven't slept. You're cold, wet, and tired, and you're getting ready to do patrols where if you fail, you may get kicked out. And you've been, all the stuff you worked for, like, it could be done. So we're doing a uh, patrol base, 24 hours doing patrol bases. It's raining. It's like 33 degrees just above freezing but it's raining you're drenched you're gonna be out in the field for three days and it's just that first night and we're in a patrol base where it's like basically a circle and you have to lay down the mud next to another guy it was me i was a staff sergeant at the time and a captain and it's like freezing cold and we're waiting an hour or so at one so one at a time we could take off our wet gear and put on cold uh wet weather gear and there was a process security process whatever we're waiting, it was at least a couple hours, and like, hey, we're about to get blown out, they're gonna throw some arty sims at us, and then we're gonna run to our next patrol base and do it all over again, and we're basically not gonna sleep for three days. Well, we basically just had to wait two more hours, and we would then move, but we're freezing. This captain looks at me, he's like, hey, Chris, I don't know if I keep doing this. Like, hey, man, just stay next to me, you're gonna keep me warm, use your body heat, we'll, we'll stay warm, we just gotta get through this. We got two hours of just shivering, and we're wet, and we're muddy, but we'll move. And he kept on looking at me. He's like, I, I don't know if I can do this. Like, man, just, just, and he's a captain and they only gets one, they only get one shot to be, a, be a green beret. And after a while of him, him and I talking, he just looks at me. He's like, I'm out. He stands up and starts walking to the cadre and quits right there. And then within the next hour, they ended up throwing an RD simulator at us. And we had a, I mean, it was a big, loud explosion. Sounds like incoming fire. And then we had to run, uh, it was like a click or two, a kilometer or two to our, our next patrol base and then do it all over again. But the point was, is like, all he had to do was just, push through that, that being uncomfortable just for a little bit. And then he would have not have to, and he had just wasted about a year of his life. And then he was never going to be a green beret, or he could just push through one hour and then survive that. And then just make it to the next day. And he would have been able to be a green beret, but in that moment, he just quit. He could not get past that, that being uncomfortable just for a little bit of time. Yeah, just you know, just to kind of piggyback on what Chris said, Hunter. You know, there's a saying in the army that you you're not fighting for yourself, but you're fighting for the person to your left and right. You know, um, at the age of 42, I did a what they call a spur ride. Uh, and I was in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. It was very humid, very <laughs> hot. We had we had 120 people that signed up for this competitive event. It's all voluntary. 90 showed up, and out of the 90 that showed up, 60 of us came across the finish line. I, I, I was the oldest one that competed out there and I was, I was in the first team to cross the finish line. But the, but the reason that is, is because in those times where you're in those austere environment environments, and if you just think about yourself and you think about the pain and you think about the conditions you're going through, the, then you very well might fail. But if you take, you know, if, if psychologically, if you're, if, if you're thinking, Hey, there's no, way I'm gonna let this beat me. And you focus your attention on those to your left and right and those that you're serving with, 
then your mind's, you know, diverted away from what you're going through. And, and before you know it, you're at the finish line. Right. And that's happened to me in so many army events, whether it was going through that one or, you know, going through, I went through air assault school and airborne school and, and all this other stuff that, uh, you know, setting, you know, getting your mind right is very important. Right. And, and if you tell yourself that you can do it, it's just, just like physical, tra physical training, you know, you got to set your mind and prepare yourself. Right. If you, if you set a goal and a plan to get up every morning at five o'clock to go run a couple of miles, then don't set one alarm clock. When you get my age, you set two. <laughs> right. But that's your motivation getting your mind right. So that's, that's what I have to add. All right. Well, we're kind of coming to the end of the webinar. And I think it's time for kind of like the big question that's been out in everybody's mind. And the point of this webinar was to expose medical students and practitioners to the military. And a huge part of the military is combat. Sad, it's, it's a sad fact that it's combat, but if, there's an, if there was one experience that you had in combat overseas that you could share, you know, what would it be? You know, and just to kind of highlight the intensity of the army um, and that you kind of wish more more civilians knew about like the stress and the uh, the role you guys played overseas. Chris, you, you mind if I go ahead and go, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, there, there's one particular event. Uh, you have to excuse me. It almost gives me emotional. I apologize. Um, you know, there, there's one particular event, February 14th of 2006. I was in Iraq and um, I trained a platoon of 30 soldiers prior to that deployment. And the training we went through was tough. And I remember even, you know, questioning my leaders like, hey, why are we doing this? Why, you know, why, why are we giving IVs uh, to people in the neck and in the hand and, and, you know, in different locations, in the feet, you know, different locations than, than just in the arm where you would normally give an IV. And, but anyway, make a long story short, uh, February 14, 2006, one of the squad leaders that I had trained got hit with an explosive form penetrator and, and, and she lost her right leg. The driver uh, had shrapnel that went through his neck. The gunner ha had shrapnel that went through his hand. The interpreter lost one of her hands. There were four in that truck. They all survived the incident, um, but it was a very significant incident. And I'll never forget that call um, because that that team had came in with a flat tire and got it, got a tire, tire change to one of their vehicles. And when that squad leader, uh, Tara Hutchinson was her name, said, what do you want me to do? I said, well, what do you, what's your job? She said to train the Iraqi police. I said, well, you still have two hours. I guess you could go train them for another two hours. And in that two hours was when she got hit with that explosive form penetrator. And her husband was in the unit. I'd helped train him also, you know, and the driver of that vehicle, uh, uh, Joshua Peasley committed suicide in 2011. Um, these are all soldiers that you, you build bonds with, you know, I, I was their leader. I kind of felt like their father, you know, they're in, in, and and helped them through these, these events and, and Tara Hutchinson, you know, she, she received a lot of help and what, and she, you know, did some interviews on TV and one of these interviews that she gave, uh, um, she made that comment that, you know, I was almost done with my mission. I went in and my operation sergeant told me to go out there and train the police. Now I, I talked to Tara and, you know, uh, she, she was a guest speaker at one of my, uh, graduations. I was in charge of a bunch of drill sergeants after that. And, and she came and was a guest speaker at our graduation. And, you know, she's told me, Hey, you'll never, she said, that was not your fault. You, you never knew that would happen. But that's that's kind of the weight that that all soldiers bear, you know, all leaders bear when you send soldiers into combat. So, and that's just one of, of of many stories that I could tell you. But that one, that one is is the one that weighs on me a little bit particularly. So go ahead, Chris. Uh, I will try to keep this unclassified. Uh, so this was a, a deployment fairly recent. It was in Iraq, 2019-20. If everyone remembers the uh, Suleimani incident, I was there. I watched the. Watched the strike. I watched that, and then there was a lot of. If you look, December 2019, there was a lot of turmoil in Baghdad with the United States Embassy in Baghdad. There was a lot of Shia militia groups that were potentially going to overrun the embassy. Uh, there was a lot of threats to where we were at, constantly having to wear body armor. Uh, I was with the unit, uh, and we were basically tasked with uh, having to go rescue the embassy. And I want you to picture you haven't really slept. You don't know what's going on. There's a lot of ambiguity. And you're basically having to come up, come up with a mission where you're going to essentially provide overwatch. It's a one way ticket. 
uh, until everyone vacates the embassy. And there's 4,000 Shia militia groups about ready to swarm on, swarm on the embassy. Uh, and having to make the phone call to your wife, like, hey, I don't know what's going on. I might not ever talk to you again. I love you. I have to go. And that was a lot different now that I'm older and have kids as opposed to when I was in the Army the first time and I was single. Uh, thankfully, uh, we were prepped ready to go. That never happened. However, about the same time when that was going on, if everyone remembers the Iranian missile crisis where Iran shot 20 theater ballistic missiles from Iran into Iraq, uh, I was there when that happened. I was in a bunker. Uh, our team was split. I couldn't get a hold of them. And last thing I heard was, hey, there's 17 uh, theater ballistic missiles headed toward, towards their location. Oh, and they might be headed towards you. So we're essentially in a bunker waiting for an impact that never came. Uh, but right after that happened, I ended up having to take this other unit to then go provide a defense of a potential location where these horde of <laughs> Shia militia groups were going to overrun our compound and having to basically call the wife in the bunker. Hey, <laughs> I might get blown up. I might not. I love you. It was very stressful. Um, and having to then lead a bunch of not only your your own men, but also a foreign partner force to basically, which could be their one way ticket to uh, <laughs> their last mission. And it was extremely tough and hard. Um, actually, there was that photo that was on the group. That was actually a picture of me after we had spent all night, uh, basically being a road bump for the the compound of having to fend them off. Uh, and I'm eating a. Uh, one that the Iraqis handed me this cup and it had some soup in it. And I hadn't eaten in like 24 hours. And like I was tired. I just popped my night vision up. I'm like, oh, soup. And at that moment, I had my buddy next to me and realized the totality of everything we had gone through where we went from, hey, we're probably going to die to I think we're I think we're safe. And just having that cup in my hand and just looking at him was like, wow, this this is this is awesome. And all this was going on when I was supposed to go home in one week. Like I had one week left of my entire deployment and all this was going on. Like I, I, I'm still doing this. I have to do it. So, um, it's been experience. It's a roller coaster. It's a ride. And, um, thankfully I'm, I'm not over yet. I'm still enjoying it while I can. Hey, Chris, now I'll tell you real quick too, as, as one veteran to, to another, you know, you remain in, in my thoughts and my family's thoughts, and I'm sure many on this call and, and prayers, you know, as you continue to serve. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you guys for sharing those stories. I'm pretty sure uh, those stories will stay with our, uh, our guests here today. Are there any questions from our attendees? I can unmute you if you raise your hand and ask these gentlemen some questions. Give it a good 2 seconds. All right, and with that, we are going to conclude tonight's session. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Chris Lowranger and Mr. Uh, Randy Cheeto for joining us tonight. If you guys could just hang on to the call real quick, and then uh, we'll have some final words. All right, everyone have a good night.